Chapter Three: A Sad Story. Good morning, Mr. Kent said, smiling. Today we're going to the lab to do some practical work. The lab was a big room with long tables, chairs, and big cupboards. There were white mice in cages. When Mr. Kent walked by their cages, they all started running around and making a lot of noise. What's the matter? Laughed Mr. Kent, speaking to the white mice. Are you afraid of me? I won't eat you. Then he looked at the class and said, "Today's lesson is about worms. I'm going to give you some worms, and you have to cut them in half. The two pieces can live and move by themselves. You'll see." I was not happy. I looked at my worm. It was long and green. I didn't want to cut it. Karen, are you afraid of your worm? Asked Mr. Kent, smiling. Give me your knife, and I can help you. His arm touched mine, and I got an electric shock. I jumped up from my chair. What's wrong, Karen? Asked Mr. Kent. Oh, nothing, nothing. I said, trying to smile. He cut the worm and then walked to the next table to help other students. I wrote a note to Walter and told him about the electric shock. Walter, I whispered. He turned around and I gave him the note.、Uh, Walter and Karen, what are you doing? Asked Mr. Kent. What do you have in your hand, Walter? His voice scared me. Walter and I were in big trouble with the teacher. Uh, nothing," said Walter. "Please pay attention," said Mr. Kent. "Next time you'll have to give me the note." "I'm sorry, Mr. Kent," said Walter. When the science lesson was over, Mr. Kent called me to his desk. "Oh no," I thought. "I'm sorry I scared you during the lesson. Two years ago, I had a bad car accident and lost my arm." My left arm is artificial; it's an electric arm. Sometimes it gives electric shocks. I was surprised and sorry. At lunch, I told Walter and Barbara about Mr. Kent's electric arm. They were both surprised. As we walked out of the cafeteria, we saw Mr. Wilkinson. "Hello, Mr. Wilkinson," said Barbara. "Oh,、uh, hi," he said, looking at us. His eyes were green again, but I didn't say anything. At half past three, Walter and I ran out of the school and waited for Mr. Wilkinson to walk by. We saw a lot of students and teachers, but we didn't see him. Finally, we saw him walking down the street, and we followed him silently. He lived near the school in a pretty white house. There was a small garden around it, and a big tree near the front door. He walked into his house, and we went quietly to a window and looked inside. He put some books on the kitchen table and opened the refrigerator. He took out a bottle of the horrible green juice and put it on the table. Then he went upstairs. Oh no! Said Walter. He went upstairs. No problem, I said. I can climb up this tree. Are you sure? Asked Walter, surprised. Of course, I said, laughing. Don't forget, I go rock climbing. Well, be careful, Karen. Said Walter. I climbed up the tree, and I could see Mr. Wilkinson's bedroom. What's happening? Whispered Walter. He's in his bedroom, and he's sitting in front of a mirror. I whispered back. His hands are on his hair. Oh no! What? Tell me. Asked Walter. I continued looking into the house. Mr. Wilkinson was now completely bald. I felt cold. Suddenly, I saw my face in Mr. Wilkinson's mirror, and he saw it too. He turned around and looked at me. I was terrified, and I didn't know what to do. I could not run away because I was at the top of a big tree. But Mr. Wilkinson didn't look angry; he looked sad. He walked over and opened the window. Karen, what are you doing up this tree? He asked. I.、Uh... Please climb down. He said. 
I want to talk to you. I climbed down the tree, and Walter was waiting for me. He looked very worried. Come on, Karen, let's run away, he said. No, Walter, we can't, I said. Mr. Wilkinson wants to talk to us. Mr. Wilkinson came out of his house and stood in the garden. You students think I'm strange, he said quietly. I can understand why. Walter and I were terrified. Let me tell you my story. Last year, my doctor told me I was very ill. I had cancer. Oh, how terrible! I'm really sorry, I said. Yes, it was terrible. I had an operation and then chemotherapy. After the operation, I lost my voice, so now I speak with a type of artificial voice. That's why my voice sounds strange. I lost all my hair from the chemotherapy, so now I wear a wig. We didn't know, said Walter. Mr. Wilkinson, we're very sorry about our terrible behavior, said Walter. Yes, please forgive us, I said. Oh, don't worry. I am getting better now, which is good, he said quietly. May I ask you a question? Walter said. Of course. What's that green juice you drink at lunch? Walter asked. He smiled and said, The green juice and the black pills are medicines. But why do your eyes change color? I asked. So you saw that, did you? You kids see everything, said Mr. Wilkinson. I wanted to do something different, so I bought a pair of colored contact lenses. I thought a new look could make me feel better. Did the contact lenses make you feel better? I asked. Mr. Wilkinson looked at me and smiled. A little. It was nice having something different for a day. But it's my job that is really making me feel better. You like your job, don't you? asked Walter. I love my job, said Mr. Wilkinson, smiling. It's wonderful to work with young people like you. Do you like Seattle? I asked. Yes, I do, said Mr. Wilkinson. It's a beautiful city with lots of parks and fun things to do. And I'm starting to make a few friends. Good, I said, smiling. Welcome to the Emerald City. We all laughed. Chapter 4 Who's in the Computer Room? After leaving Mr. Wilkinson's house, Walter and I talked about our visit. Both of us felt very sorry about our behavior. I think we learned a big lesson today, said Walter. Some people seem strange because they have problems, big problems. But they're people just like you and me, and they need our help and friendship. I agree with you, Walter, I said. But we learned two important lessons today, thanks to Mr. Wilkinson. We must help and understand others. And it's not nice to invade someone's privacy. I thought about Mr. Kent and his artificial arm. He was another person with a big problem. Well, the mystery is solved, I said. Mr. Wilkinson isn't an alien. He's a very nice teacher. We walked in silence for a few minutes. We were both thinking about Mr. Wilkinson. Hey, do you want to get an ice cream now? I finally asked Walter. Good idea, Walter said. Let's invite Barbara. Yeah, let's, I said. It's almost five o'clock and basketball practice is over. I'll send her a text message. Thirty minutes later, we met Barbara and we sat down by the sea and ate our three large ice creams. So, what's happening? asked Barbara. We have a lot of news for you, I said. Really? Well, don't make me wait. Tell me immediately, said Barbara, laughing. We told her everything. 
the news about the comet and the intergalactic voyages and how we had the idea that Mr. Wilkinson was an alien. We told her about what happened when we followed Mr. Wilkinson home and the teacher's sad story. Barbara listened carefully, and she was very surprised. The poor man, she said sadly. What a terrible problem. And he's alone here in Seattle, isn't he? Karen, let's make him a delicious chocolate cake next weekend. My mom can help us. It'll be a welcome present. Yes, let's do it on Sunday afternoon. Then we can take it to school on Monday, I said. He'll love it. Well, girls, I'm not a good cook, but the chocolate cake sounds great, said Walter. Now tell me more about intergalactic voyages, said Barbara. Yes, please do, I said. Perhaps aliens will come to visit Earth. Walter told us a lot of interesting things about UFOs and aliens. I suddenly noticed that it was getting dark. I tried to look at my watch, but it wasn't on my arm. Oh no, I said. Where's my watch? Then I remembered. I took it off in the gym at lunchtime. I'm sure I left it there near the showers after volleyball. I must go and get it now. Don't worry, Karen. The janitor will find it and put it in a safe place. You can get it in the morning, said Barbara. But that watch is really important to me. It was a present from my grandparents, I said. But the school's closed at this time, said Walter. No, it's not closed today because Mrs. Wong is preparing some math tests for her classes, I said. How do you know that? asked Walter. I heard her talking to Miss Cruz this morning, I said. You know everything, said Barbara, smiling. Okay, then. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Walter also smiled and said, Good luck. I ran to Washington High, and the main door was open. I went in and started going to the gym, but something stopped me. I had a strange feeling, but I didn't know what it was. Something was pushing me upstairs. I was afraid because the school was dark and silent. I started going up the stairs to the first floor. Where am I going? The gym is downstairs. Why am I going upstairs? I asked myself. My heart was beating faster and faster. Something was waiting for me at the top of the stairs. I knew it. But what was it? I wanted to run home, but I could not do it. I had to find out. When I got up to the third floor, I saw a light on in the computer room. I went quietly to the door. Someone was working in front of a computer. It was Mr. Kent. He was writing a long line of numbers and letters. Suddenly, I saw the face of an alien on his computer screen. The alien had a green head and big red eyes. It didn't have a nose or any hair. Its mouth and ears were very small. Then, Mr. Kent put both of his hands on his head. He closed his eyes and started pulling his hair. He was taking his hair and his face off. Suddenly, Mr. Kent had a green face like the alien on the screen. He was an alien. I was terrified, but I could not run away. He started talking to the alien on the screen. Clyreg is calling home. Clyreg here, he said. All tank pillex, Clyreg. This is your leader speaking. How are things going? said the alien on the screen with a strange voice. Everything is fine, Gortz, but I'm tired of this mask. Life as a human is difficult, he said. Your work on Earth is very important, said the alien. You have to stay there until everything is finished. Did you choose the student who will come to Mitrax? No, I'm going to choose one tomorrow, said Mr. Kent. What? I thought. He's going to take a student to another planet? 
This is terrible. There's little time, Clyreg. You have to hurry. Remember, we'll meet you and the student at the old airfield behind the school on Friday night at 9.30 p.m. Don't be late. When the comet leaves the Virgo constellation at midnight, the intergalactic doors close, and then we can't return to Mitrax for another 600 years. I know, Gortz. I won't be late, said Mr. Kent. Good. But how will you get the student? You can't touch him or her because you're electric. I have a plan, said Mr. Kent. On Friday evening, there's a PTA meeting at school. There will be a lot of people here. Teachers, parents, and students. During the meeting, I'll ask a student to come with me to the science lab. Then I'll spray him with my special X5 spray. With the X5 spray, humans can't think anymore. They forget who they are. They can only obey. The student will follow me to the old airfield. Everything on Mitrax is ready for the human, said the alien. We want to study him. Good. I'll thank Pilex, Gortz, said Mr. Kent to the alien. Then he wrote a long line of numbers and letters on the computer screen, and it turned black. I went quickly and quietly down the stairs and ran out of the building. I started running down the street and across the park. I could not stop thinking about the green head and the big red eyes of the alien. And I could not believe that Mr. Kent was an alien and he was planning something terrible. What could I do to stop him? I had to talk to Walter and Barbara. I felt cold and my heart was beating fast. I wanted to get home as fast as possible.